Welcome to the latest uh, edition of Danube Dialogues. Uh, I'm delighted today to welcome our guest, uh, Sir Richard Dearlove. Sir Richard is the chairman of the Board of Trustees of the University of London, a distinguished university founded in the 19th century by Jeremy Bentham. He was previously the head of a college and a much older university, namely Cambridge, um, from which he graduated um, as Master um, MA in the 1960s. After that, he entered um, British intelligence um, and served in a variety of postings around the world until in 1999 he became the head of the Secret Intelligence Service, or MI6. Sir Richard, uh, welcome to Danube Dialogues. I'm now going to ask my colleague, uh, Mark Higgy, formerly Australian ambassador to the European Union, to NATO and to Hungary, uh, to start the questioning. Mark. Well, thank you very much, John, and, uh, and also a warm welcome to you, Sir Richard, uh, from me. Um, we thought we might uh, kick off uh, on the very topical issue of uh, Bre Brexit and, uh, and uh, prospects for Britain uh, more generally. Now, you were, um, uh, I think, one of the very few um, uh, and certainly the most distinguished member of the, um, of the in former intelligence community who advocated uh, Brexit. Um, uh, what, what, what would you say that, uh, that you saw that your colleagues missed? about the whole issue of Britain leaving the EU? Well, I think on the issue of you know, Brexit specifically, I mean, I had the good fortune, as it were, to have retired in 2004 and escaped what I would describe as the Whitehall foreign policy bubble. Um, I think it's important to point out that most of the foreign policy and national security establishment uh, in Whitehall were, you know, really devoted to the European concept um, and didn't really think critically beyond it and didn't imagine, I think, that the government could lose a referendum. Um, I mean, I, in my earlier career, was certainly passionately European, but had become very disillusioned uh, indeed. So that's one sort of general point. I think the other thing to say is it was never specifically said by the British government, but one aspect of our national security policy, which was pursued by both Conservative and Labour governments over a long period of time, was really to make sure that the European Commission didn't have any share uh, in dictating our national security. We, we, we had a deliberate policy of keeping it out of the Commission's hands. And we were pretty aggressive about that behind the scenes. The only exception was in some of the areas of police and justice and some of the areas of, of data exchange, which are covered by EU legislation. But more generally, we were really very keen to make sure that the Commission didn't, as it were, over time establish any say in areas of national security. And I, I don't know if you remember, when the European uh, Constitution, which was admittedly never adopted, was drafted, um, I went around uh, Europe um, unannounced, very discreetly, persuading the key nations of the EU to cross out every reference to national security which appeared in that document which we succeeded in doing and i use that as a sort of illustration of the position um, the other point i'd make in terms of escaping the whitehall bubble um, i'm cornish by origin which is you know a very peripheral part of the U uk um, but, you know, for me, uh, I'm, I'm a passionate sort of Cornishman in my local attachments. Um, and it is actually the one place in the UK which receives more EU development funds than any other area. It's benefited hugely um, financially from the EU. But I knew from, you know, being local, living down there, talking to local farmers, fishermen, or you know, the people that ran tourist businesses, that none of these people were going to vote 
remain. They were all going to leave. Now, if, as it were, a county, which was a great beneficiary of EU funds, was going to vote leave, it told me that outside the London bubble, something really strange was happening. And um, when I was uh, still sort of, you know, around in London, looking at these issues and talking to sort of senior people in the policy establishment, I said, you're going to lose this referendum. They thought I was mad um, in predicting that loss. And I said, no, absolutely, you're going to lose it. And you're going to lose it quite clearly. So, I mean, that's really some of the background to quite a complex question. I mean, I can give you some other uh, comments and views about the EU and why I sort of uh, turned against it as an institution. Um, uh, one thing I, I would recommend, and if no, I, I mean, I hope it's published as a sort of pamphlet book, but the London Review of Books in its last three editions have run the series of articles by someone whose politics I do not share. He's a left-wing intellectual, but a very, very fine intellectual called Perry Anderson. And Perry Anderson has completely taken apart the EU as a political institution. And it's, it's a truly brilliant set. Um, it, it's very long um, and it, it's an extraordinary deconstruction of the EU and what's basically wrong with it. And I, I mean, let me just, I, this very brief quote, but at, at the end, you know, summing up where the EU is, he said, he talked about dilution of sovereignty without meaningful democracy compulsory unanimity without participant equality and the cult of the free market without care of free trade. And I think that's a, that's a pretty extraordinary summary of what, you know, what, if you think about it, what's wrong. Yeah, absolutely. Would, 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 would you uh, see yourself as one of those uh, people who advocated uh, Brexit, who um, was comfortable with the European project uh, when it was essentially um, a regional trade promotion uh, organisation, the common market, um, but who, uh, whose, whose doubts and concerns grew as soon as you got into the 90s and the whole Maastricht uh, uh, phenomenon and, of course, that, that being built on uh, in the subsequent decades. Yes, I think that summarises it reasonably well. I, I mean, there's no question that, that the UK benefited enormously from belonging, you know, to it when it was basically you know, a sophisticated zolverine, um, you know, a, a customs union and a trading agreement. Um, but as it assumed more political and legal power and legal and political aspirations, I think this is where there's a significant parting of the ways. I mean, Perry Anderson takes to pieces the origins of the European Court of Justice, the ECJ. And I, I mean, it, it's an extraordinary story, the way that the ECJ has assumed legal powers to which it has no real constitutional right whatsoever. And how there's no mechanism for challenging at all ECJ decisions. Um, and I mean, it's become absolutely clear that uh, the way that the EU is travelling is, is completely out of step with the political traditions of the UK. However faulty those, those may be, there is a sort of fundamental parting of, of the ways. And I, I, I mean, I think people in the UK now are beginning to understand better why Brexit, you know, was inevitable over a period of time. And, and really, that's where we are now. Wouldn't you also say, Sir Richard, because I, like you, have read uh, the Perry Anderson piece, which is a wonderful piece. It's a, and for someone who's known and read Perry Anderson's work over the years, a piece that surprised me very strongly. Um, but wouldn't you say that the indictment he gives of the undemocratic centralization of powers in unaccountable institutions, that's not only um, going in a different direction, f very far from our uh, institutions and traditions in England, but also the same is surely true of countries like Denmark and Sweden, um, and certainly in the newly democratic countries of Central Europe, where, after all, 
they know what it's like to be governed <laughs> by an unaccountable institution in a remote foreign city. And I have a sense that the, the problems that, um, th that the EU has had with Britain, it is going to have, perhaps in a more uh, modest way, with a lot of the countries that at the moment it simply assumes are loyal EU member states. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think it's heading into very stormy waters. I mean, in a way, it's stuck. It can't go backwards. And it really can't go forwards either. Um, because of the point you're making about, you know, the lack of account, political accountability, the lack of um, the ability of, you know, the people of Europe to challenge the decisions it's taking. There's no mechanism. And I mean, the European Parliament is a fiasco. You know, the European Parliament doesn't, um, uh, it doesn't make the EU accountable. Um, and I think it's heading into a very difficult period. I mean, I, I was a historian originally and nearly became an academic historian. And I mean, in my view, and I think this is a fair summary, you know, the, the EU was very successful in what it was originally set up to do, which was to stop France and Germany going to war again. You know, after the sort of history of 19th and first half of the 20th century. And, and, and to rebuild Europe economically. And it was superbly successful at doing that. But I mean, in a way, you know, its historic role is finished. Um, and, you know, it, it very much was something that evolved out of the aftermath of World War II. And the world now is changing and shifting in a very dramatic fashion. And, you know, the inadequacies the fact that of the institution, the fact that it's on the wrong geopolitical road, in my opinion, is beginning to show very clearly. Um, I, I mean, I'm a passionate European, but I, I don't, as it were, support the EU as an institution any longer. Um, you know, I, I, I think, I think we, it, the, the whole project needs to be rethought. Um, and if it could be rethought, I mean, I, I, I Originally, during the sort of Brexit debate, I wrote an open letter to Macron that got, you know, quite widely publicised um, and was published in France. And, and basically, my argument was, you know, if the UK stays in, you'll never achieve any of your political aspirations because we'll stop them. And we're very good at doing that. Um, but, you know, it's in the UK's national interest in its sort of national security interest that you know you have a politically cohesive Europe but that in my book doesn't mean as it were a Europe that's heading down the track towards a, a federal system it, 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 it's a unity of strong nations if you see what I mean and that's got to then take account of the different interests of those nations and I, I mean, I think that, you know, Macron's slightly got off the wrong, onto the wrong track in that sense, because the, he's been pushing a federal concept. I think if, if, he, if he had been true to French traditions, I mean, of all the nations of Europe, you know, the proudest in a way, in terms of its cultural and political identity, if you wish, is France. Um, uh, and and I, I think the whole project now has reached a point where it needs to be rethought. The you, EU has always claimed credit for establishing peace in Europe. Um, but in fact, it, I would argue, I wonder what your view is, that it would be truer to say that the EU is the product of a peace guaranteed by the United States. And if the US guarantee of European peace in effect atrophies or is even withdrawn, what then happens? Well, you put your finger on a really yeah, crucial issue. And of course, the sort of US security umbrella that was provided, you know, Pax Americana, um, and you could argue that very convincingly. I mean, in my book, you know, the way I view this, I mean, it really all depends on how Germany evolves and develops. Um, in, in terms of Europe's future, I mean, I think at the moment, yes, that um, uh, alliance with the United States, the sort of security guarantee is absolutely crucial because there's nothing to replace it. That 
maybe that takes one into the sort of future of NATO. But I can imagine a Europe which was based on an alliance between Germany, France and the UK, the three, you know, primary military powers, or they would be the three primary military powers with a different relationship that they've got now from Russia, with Russia. Um, but, you know, this presupposes quite a significant political shift, um, both in Germany in terms of their attitude towards defence spending and both uh, in Russia in terms of their attitude towards how they modulate and manage their relationship with the West. Um, and so, I mean, uh, the, the thing is that, you know, we, we have a package of security measures and you can't just dump those and rethink the project. But I, if I had to make a prediction, you know, in the course of this century, we will see very significant changes in European security. And I think if I'm asked to predict this is going to be a sort of concert of nations, you know, we're going to go back more in the direction towards the sort of Congress of Vienna. And maybe if isolationism in the United States, it, you know, which, which certainly predates Trump, um, is now a significant trend. Europe may have to rethink its security, but for the time being, that's not going to happen. Just, just returning to um, Brexit, I wonder if we could bring uh, the discussion to the, uh, to the last uh, month and, the, um, and uh, Boris Johnson's uh, Brexit trade deal with, uh, with the EU. What, 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 what sort of marks out of 10 would you give uh, the trade deal that he delivered? 7.5. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a, he's done pretty well in adverse circumstances. I, I mean, uh, I, I was a huge opponent of the previous uh, agreement that we were edging towards, um, and the withdrawal uh, agreement, um, for all sorts of reasons. Um, you know, because it it, 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 it it didn't achieve enough for the UK. I think we, we have a sufficient a sort of liberation now from the European project to go our own way. What's really crucial is that, you know, we, we, we are no longer going to recognise um, the, le the uh, legislative um, power of, the, of, of ECJ, um, European Court of Justice. And I, I, I think... You know, Boris has done pretty well. That's not to say that there aren't some areas which are causing problems. And, um, you know, they aren't economically hugely significant like fishing, but they're certainly highly emotive in terms of being social uh, issues, uh, which, you know, do affect the optics of what this agreement looks like. And I mean, the arrangements in Ireland are pretty odd, too. Um, and um, I'm not sure how well those are going to work. But the idea, you know, that the Irish border was going to, you know, the terrorism was going to come back. And I mean, some of the stuff that was said, you know, pre-agreement was, was really massively exaggerated. <clears throat> and and um, uh, I think on the whole, Boris has done a pretty, pretty damn good job. In, in, and I'm, I'm pleased with the outcome. Yeah. Do, do, do you think uh, Britain now moves on from Brexit or are some of these issues going to linger and possibly cause difficulties for, for the, um, uh, the government? The one, the one uh, um, area you didn't mention that uh, the government's got a lot of uh, criticism, including from Scotland, is, is, is just all the new paperwork that is involved with... Uh, uh, for exporters. Now, uh, uh, um, defenders of the government say this is just teething, teething problems. Uh, or, I mean, is that or any of the other issues likely to be on the front pages um, as we go forward? Well, I think it's going to get <clears throat> a fair amount of attention and there's going to be a lot of complaint from those sectors of the economy that are affected. But I mean, I do think it is a process of adaption. Um, and maybe there'll be some simplifications. Um, and, you know, there will be changes in supply chains. Um, I mean, fishing is an obvious one, you know, where uh, if your cargo is going to rot in the back of a lorry, um, 
you, you can't spend weeks filling in paperwork and waiting to go through customs. Um, so there, there will have to be some changes and adaptions in those areas. But I, I mean, I don't think any of these issues are going to um, you know, really undermine the position of the government. I, I think overall they've secured a pretty good deal. And the press even um, has not been unfavorable. I, I mean, the, the, the bits of the press that are remain um, are just not, not going to change their tune. And they will at some point stop banging on about it. Um, and we'll be looking to, you know, a different set of arrangements. And I think actually this is quite exciting. Yeah. One, one issue that uh, Boris Johnson, uh, uh, I'm sure, would wish would go away is the issue of uh, illegal immigration, particularly the cross-channel phenomenon, uh, which has surged in the last couple of years. Now, this is, a, I would have thought, a, a real problem for the government in that it undermines one of its major arguments for Brexit, re-establishing control over Britain's borders. Um, uh, would, 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 would you say that the government is doing everything it could reasonably ask of it to, 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 to stop this uh, or, or not? Um, well, I think they've done pretty well. I mean, Pretty Patel as Home Secretary has done a, a, a good job. She's, she's tough. Um, she's set up a new uh, coordination organisation based down on the South Coast, which is run by a former senior Royal Marine officer. Um, the problem is, you know, we, we, we also depend to an extent on what happens on the French coast uh, in particular, and therefore liaison with the French is an important aspect of controlling this problem. Um, you know, for part of my career, I was responsible specifically in Paris for four years for dealing with the French um, security authorities. And, you know, I know the scenario there extremely well. Um, the relationship with the French in this area is generally very good. I, I mean, I'm sure there's a bit of Brexit bruising, but we really need to get back to these very close and very fruitful relationships we had um, with all aspects of the French national security infrastructure. And uh, I mean, there is a very close and a very seasoned and very mature relationship there. And I, I think that just needs a little bit of, it, ne it needs a little bit of attention. It needs putting back to where it was. I mean, interestingly, whilst, um, you know, these Brexit arguments recently were going on and the French were sort of stopping trucks because of supposedly COVID, the pandemic, you know, British and French paratroopers were exercising together on Salisbury Plain uh, in a very fruitful and close relationship. Yeah. Of course, when, when, when faced with a similar situation, Australia um, uh, took a very straightforward uh, policy of, uh, of simply turning boats around uh, to in, uh, coming out of Indonesia. You don't think Britain can do something as straightforward as that? Uh, I think that's going to be tough. I mean, I, I, I admire the tough line the Australians took. And I think, you know, geographically, you were able to do that. It's a little more complicated uh, in Europe, and there's a humanitarian issue there. Um, I mean, I think, I think the way that things are going, um, they will certainly, they're, they're, they're taking a, a tougher line. And, um, there will be more control in the future. And I think better cross-channel cooperation is probably the answer. But before we leave what we might call uh, the topic of Britain's grand strategy after Brexit, could I just ask whether or not you see um, any virtual uh, utility in the idea of uh, either Kanzuk, Canada uh, alliance between Britain, Canada, Australia and New Zealand, um, which already exists uh, along with the Americans in um, the Five Eyes network. But do you see that as, uh, in a sense, uh, the, the overall um, vision that might um, drive uh, some future um, British um, uh, view of its role in the world? Do you see any use in that? Yes, I do. I see a great deal of use. I mean, I think our sort of position in the Anglosphere uh, is a very 
important asset. Um, and, uh, you know, Five Eyes, the relationship, the traditional intelligence relationship between that group of countries is very significant because geographically, <laughs> you know, it gives you assets strung across the globe. And I, I mean, if you're a professional, you understand the significance of that comment, um, particularly when you get into areas of technical intelligence collection and, and other things like that. I mean, my own feeling is that one of the things that we clearly now, you know, as we return to those relationships being of more primary importance to the UK, we also need to rebuild the Navy. Um, and I think the current defense review will be largely oriented um, towards building more naval ships. Uh, and then there will be a certain amount of, 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 of technical capability on drones and special forces and those sorts of areas. Uh, you know, I, I mean, the idea of the UK at the moment, you know, fighting a European land war seems very remote, but the likelihood of us needing um, a powerful navy again, I think, is it, 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 it is much greater, and I and I think all of this will be reflected as the Johnson government begins to model um, its it, it, its future direction. Now, there is something I, I would also say about you know European security and European defence. Uh, I mean, Five Eyes in terms of the UK's capability. I mean, the UK contributes to European defence more than 50% in a number of really crucial areas. I mean, and the capability of our defence forces are really important to the European security. This is, uh, you know, our contribution is big. Five Eyes makes it even more powerful and more significant, and it's important to remember that. Could, could we just finish with a quick uh, um, uh, um, view from Sir Richard on Scotland? Um, we're all fascinated by the civil war going on at the moment within the, the SNP, and yet still the, uh, the SNP looks, uh, looks to be the favourite for the elections which are held whenever they will be this year. Uh, so obviously there is still a, a significant possibility of them being returned and then pressing for a second independence referendum. Where do you think that's going to go? Do you think Boris Johnson will remain firm, resisting a second referendum? Yeah, I think he will. Um, I mean, we had a ref referendum and it was meant to settle the issue for 20 years. Um, there was a clear result, it wasn't controversial. Um, okay, the issue has been uh, complicated because of Brexit. But on the other hand, um, you know, a legal referendum requires the agreement of Westminster. Um, my information is that the government will take a tough line on that and refuse a, a referendum. Um, I mean, Scottish nationalism as expressed politically comes and goes. It hasn't followed a continuous upward graph. Um, I think it will be highly uh, influenced by economic circumstances. The argument is whether um, independent Scotland would be sustainable economically is, is a tough one. Um, its situation could be rather fragile, getting more fragile. So, I mean, there are, there are a lot of factors that will, as it were, influence this issue. I'm sure SNP will do well in the next election, although it's it, it, a little bit depends, well, maybe quite a lot depends on this, this current investigation, current court case, and how that plays out. I mean, uh, uh, if Nicola Sturgeon comes out of that, well, she would have to resign, I think, if it comes out that she's she, she misled or she lied. Um, but we'll, we'll, we'll see. That's certainly going to affect the SNP. But on the other hand, you know, post-Brexit with the problems over fishing and things like that, the SNP will probably win the next elections pretty handsomely. She would clearly have preferred uh, there to have been a no-deal Brexit that would have suited her political purposes, I think. So it's now, it's now more difficult, I think, for her to... Um, to, to, to argue that, which is why I suppose uh, there should be a little bit of concern about a lot of the 
people complaining about the new paperwork being uh, Scottish fish exporters. Uh, I suppose that's a, um, it could, 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 could blow up a bit, you know. But, it um, could blow up, but I, I, I think that that will work itself out and probably, you know, look rather different in five or six months' time. But, but let, let's see how that, that plays through. Um, I, I mean, I, I think it would be, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, traditionalists would be catastrophic if um, for the union, you know, if Scotland does look like leaving, um, it would be very damaging to the country. And, uh, you know, once again, as a historian, you only have to look at things like, you know, the Scottish Enlightenment to see how important Scotland has been. Um, you know, as, a, as, a, as an intellectual powerhouse, historically. I mean, you know, Scotland is an extraordinary phenomenon for a small country. Um, and, you know, Adam Smith, David Hume, <laughs> there's many, many examples of that. Robertson, the historian, there are many, and, and their contribution to engineering, and I, I mean, it's phenomenal. I think it would be catastrophic for the countries to break apart. Hmm. Yes, uh, um, I, I agree, and, and it's very hard to see how uh, um, the court case doesn't reduce and damage the reputations of both Nicola Sturgeon um, and uh, her predecessor Alex Salmond, the two principal leaders of the Scottish National Party for the, in this generation. Well, what's extraordinary about the political situation in Scotland at the moment, the SNP, if you actually look at their government record, are pretty incompetent. I mean, this is what's so, so and she, she appears to be so popular. I mean, I cannot quite get my head around what the Scots are up to because, you know, in, in areas of education, social policy, all sorts of areas, the SNP's been an absolute disaster or not, you know, maybe that's exaggerated, but it's certainly not successful. It's been pretty poor. And I, well, I would say there's also been a degree and extent to which it's actually been slightly sinister, by which I mean these proposals that you hear uh, that to extend the control of offensive speech uh, to the family home, um, which you hear also in London, but which were, as far as I can see, pioneered by the Scottish Minister of Justice. So there are a lot of things to, dis to, to discuss about them. But I'd like to change, if I could, uh, um, I, uh, to a different topic, and about 10 years ago, you, wrote, you took a sabbatical to write an appreciation of the intelligence failures leading to the Iraq uh, invasion and war. Uh, and I was wondering if you could give us a brief outline of what those conclusions were, what your conclusions were. Well, I haven't, um, I haven't written a book. <laughs> I mean, I basically um, have tried I haven't even finished it, to write a historical document, which when I can no longer be prosecuted for revealing national security secrets, you know, would be available in an archive so that anyone who researches the Iraq war will understand a lot better what the hell was going on. And I mean, I think I was in a pretty unique position. Um, uh, I mean, I should say straight away, I, 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 I hate the word intelligence failure, obviously being an intelligence officer, because, you know, Intelligence is usually in a permanent state of failure when it doesn't know something, um, if you see what I mean. So, uh, and, and the, we actually, uh, well, I think what I would say is that the, the, the issue is pretty badly misunderstood because it was grasped by the opponents of the war, it was grasped by the media, and it's now sort of dominated by thinking on issues which is misleading. It, it doesn't really get to the truth of what happened. Um, and, and I would like to try to clarify that. Yes, some of the intelligence was clearly misleading or wrong. A hell of a lot of it, and this isn't really properly understood, was exactly right. Um, so it's not, as it were, just that issue. I, I think if, if I tried to summarize it, I would say the Americans did not go to war on the basis of the intelligence. They went to war on the basis of a policy decision because they felt that the containment policy of Iraq was not working. Tony Blair was determined to support the American position. And if you're a British prime minister, 
It's pretty hard not to do that. The mistake that was made in the UK was to get his decision past the Parliamentary Labour Party. He used the intelligence as the argument in Parliament. Had he just taken a policy decision to support the Americans without trying to use the intelligence, we would never have got into, as it were, the mess that we got into afterwards. The other point I would make, which I think is really important in understanding the Iraq war, is that much of the intelligence that we had was well-placed and close to Saddam Hussein. What Saddam Hussein was learning from his officials was not the truth about what was happening in the country. The man was such a violent tyrant that if you told him the wrong thing, you were likely literally to get your head chopped off. Uh, and, uh, you know, a number of Iraqi officials were certainly killed by the regime in those circumstances. So those people responsible for the weapons programs, which had restarted in Iraq, were telling Saddam Hussein that they were more advanced than they actually were. And our intelligence reflected the fact that they were exaggerating. What we didn't do was compensate for the fact that they were, as it were, giving him an accurate record of where they were. So, I, I mean, I think if anyone reads eventually what I will write or am writing, they will understand these issues a lot better. I mean, the problem is I'm not allowed to go into great detail about the sources um, and uh, the reasons uh, why I hold these views. Um, but uh, I was very, very disappointed in the outcome of the Chilcot inquiry, although it took um, eight years. Uh, I've got it here on the bookshelf next to me. It's longer than the Bible. There are a whole lot of issues in there, which I actually wrote to Chilcott about, which are completely unaddressed and unanswered. Um, so the product, this inquiry, is a very strange document because it doesn't get its head around some of the primary points. The, the only good thing about the, the Chilcott inquiry is it, the phenomenal chronology. And, uh, you know, I appear in that chronology 94 times. So, yes, I was heavily involved. <laughs> well, perhaps almost maybe more important is what happened after Saddam Hussein had been defeated and that we were remained in Iraq and the Americans remained in Iraq for some time. I mean, uh, that doesn't seem on the face of it to have been a success. Why do you think it uh, either went wrong or at least didn't go better? The intelligence that we had pretty much predicted what would happen in Iraq if the Iraqi military were dispersed. What you have to understand is that there were rings around Saddam and the most distant ring were part of the Iraqi military, not the Republican Guard or the Special Republican Guard or any of the security organizations. So the country could have been run by a military council of, okay, they were Ba'athist generals, but they were not too contaminated. They weren't that close to Saddam. And the country would have been, as it were, controlled in terms of law and order. I'm afraid that the Department of Defense had a very ideological approach uh, and they took a completely different route, which was, we were not even consulted in the UK when the Iraqi army was dissolved, the military were dissolved. I mean, I, there was a whole succession 
of events, which, you know, really are painful for me now to have to talk about. Um, because, you know, it needn't have been like that. They raced too fast for a democratic election when the country wasn't ready for it. Um, the dispersal of the army meant that all these weapons went into so-called civilian population. Um, you know, it, it, it was a c catastrophe. At one point, when this was all going wrong, uh, th this will eventually be, I, 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 in this notes that I'm writing, I was <laughs> smuggled into the Pentagon because it was, this was the only deal, of, in fact, it was Henry Kissinger was responsible for doing this, to have a three hour meeting alone with Rumsfeld to try to explain to him why the British view, which was really based on our tribal contacts and understanding, why you know, things were going so badly wrong. I had an extraordinary meeting, three hours, detailed notes taken, it didn't have the slightest influence whatsoever on how the Americans dealt with the situation. I, I think it's uh, also we, the Americans and the British had, in a sense, different candidates. He was a Shia, you know, that politician who had been in the States, who uh, really sort of charmed the pants off, you know, the DOD, and they backed him. And, you know, w we knew, I mean, I, we warned them, this would not work. Um, anyway, it, it, it was a chapter of... What actually happened internally in Iraq, it was, it was a great shame because it needn't have turned out like that, in my opinion. Well, let's move on to a, a wider question here, which is, first of all, what do you think um, th th that period has, uh, what lessons does it have for Western policy in the Middle East? And um, you've been, um, a subordinate question, but you've been um, uh, taking a different view to many people um, about the dangers of Islamist terrorism to Britain. I think you regard it as being a risk, but not, a, not a, one of the most severe risks. Well, it was, I mean, I, I have sympathy with the politicians here. You know, if you have a, a, a severe internal terrorist problem, um, because of the sort of pressure from the media, you know, you, it's got to be right up front. But, I mean, let's be absolutely clear that, that, that there was no systemic risk to the United Kingdom from Islamist terrorism. There, there were the risk of very ugly and, and horrible incidents, which you know, which, which have occurred, um, you know, successively post 9/11 in the UK. Although I think the the the, the, the security um, infrastructure is much more efficient in dealing with the problem than it was. I mean, you know, we learned a huge amount. We had to learn it pretty fast, and the problem is still there in terms of radicalization. But I mean, I think that what I was saying was, you know, we need to keep this issue in proportion. It doesn't need to turn society upside down. And um, I mean, I know what happened inside the national security infrastructure in terms of the amount of money and resources that went in, um, you know, to, to dealing with this problem and, 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 and being on top of it. But I, I think in a way, it was at the expense of so many other international issues for the intelligence community. And I, I mean, now what's happened for obvious reasons is things are coming back into balance. And, you know, we're taking more seriously now, you know, the big geopolitical issues, the rise of China, the behavior of, the, of, of Russia, um, you know, all of these other issues which, you know, concern uh, the Western intelligence community. But I mean, Islamist uh, terrorism became massively overdominant. Um, and I was really arguing uh, not so much against the seriousness of the incident, but the fact that this was not a sort of systemic security risk to the future of the nation. Hmm. Well, thank you. Uh, we, we have a lot of other questions. So, Mark, I better pass on to you now the baton to raise China. Indeed. Thanks. Thanks, John. Yes. Um, so, Richard, you, uh, um, uh, you really um, stood out uh, with your very um, 
strong position in the middle of uh, last year arguing that um, uh, your view was that the, mo the greatest likelihood was that the coronavirus escaped from a Chinese lab. I think you emphasised uh, accidentally. Um, but um, is that, is, is that a, well, firstly, I'd say that the, uh, the recently uh, that view has received a lot of uh, uh, support, particularly from the United States, um, senior figures in the, in the US administration saying pretty much the same thing. Um, do, you, do you maintain that view that you, you set out uh, last year? Well, let me put it like this. I think what's shocking is that there has been no proper scientific debate as to whether this is a zoonotic natural creation or whether it's um, a chimera. I, I mean, I, a natural virus which has been subjected to gain of function experiments which came out of the Wuhan laboratory. Um, and there was a rush to accept the Chinese explanation and a number of Western virologists who are closely related in terms of research work with Chinese research work have been extraordinary apologists for the Chinese. Um, I mean, I'll uh, name two. Um, Peter Dashak, who is, 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 is absolutely insistent that this is a zoonotic occurrence, and the editor of Nature has refused um, to publish articles which have questioned the Chinese position. Um, and uh, this is quite extraordinary, given the way that they would rush out, you know, a Chinese apologist or articles that support it, but would not touch anything else. Now, what's interesting is in the last few months, the view that I originally articulated saying that the escapee uh, was a strong possibility um, has really gained resonance and some really very serious um, scientists now are share my view, A, that there's been no debate, and B, that the um, gain of function argument is quite a strong one. And uh, I mean, that's really where I am at the moment. Now, I base this on articles written by two a very eminent scientists, um, Professor Dal Gleish, who's at St. George's Hospital in, in London, and a very well-known um, Norwegian virologist called Berger Sorensen. And um, they wrote an article which was more on vaccine science, which was published in the Quarterly Review of Biophysics back in May or June, advocating a particular approach. And if you read the article carefully, you realize that their argument were, was that there were inserts in the RNA of the virus. And they used the phrase inserts. Now, what's interesting about that article, it's been downloaded 200,000 times <laughs> from, uh, uh, you know, this is, this is a rather sort of specialist journal. I mean, what this tells me is there are a lot of scientists now out there and I see this as a growing band of people who are saying, hang on a moment. It's really up to the Chinese now to, to explain why the gain of function chimera is not, as it were, the origin. I, I mean, the, the, the onus has shifted and we're very much in this debate. And I'm told that um, uh, the new administration in the United States is, is very much focused on this question and is taking seriously the fact that the virus could well be the result of an escapee from an institute and has been experimented on. Uh, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, it's so enormously contagious um, because of the nature of the spike protein and the chances of this occurring in nature. I mean, I won't go into it. I mean, I've been very preoccupied with this and trying to make sure that there's a proper academic debate. And that's been my main concern. I'm quite happy to admit I'm not a scientist and that maybe, you know, 
there's a wrong argument here and it is zoonotic. But there hasn't been any debate at all. But there is going to be a debate now and that's important. I imagine that your uh, expectations of the current WHO investigative team in China would be low? Well, um, very low. I mean, they're not allowed, you know, they're working on Zoom. Why do they go to China if they're working on Zoom? Um, and, you know, the person who's been key is Peter Daszak. Daszak is is the main uh, scientific cooperator of the woman from the Wuhan Institute is telling us all it's zoonotic. Um, I mean, the whole thing is, is scientifically disgraceful. Absolutely. You know, here we've got the biggest crisis, you know, we've had uh, since World War II, uh, affecting every country. And, um, you know, the, the, the Chinese are doing everything in their power uh, to prevent a proper scientific debate. Yes. What do you say about the Biden administration's approach on this issue is uh, encouraging, I suppose. Uh, I mean, many people uh, have a default expectation that uh, Biden is going to be softer on China than, uh, uh, than well, was, maybe what, was, what was Trump. Be, I, I think, I, I wouldn't say soft, he's probably just going to be more civilised. <laughs> well, more civilised. But, but what, what I was going to say was, uh, uh, related to that, um, I mean, do you think we will ever get to the bottom of where this virus came from? Well, I think the problem is that we may not. And, uh, you know, the, the, the sites where the evidence may have lain have been um, cleaned. Uh, and I, 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 think, I think we probably have to end up with a balance of probabilities and a balance of scientific probabilities. Um, but, um, you know, watch this space. I think Dalgleish and um, Sorensen are, uh, are publishing a second paper. If we can get it published, this will be very interesting to see, which is specifically on the etiology of the virus. Uh, and um, there are certainly one or two very eminent um, American uh, scientists, um, one in particular who's the professor of microbiology at uh, Stanford, David Relman. And, 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 and Relman is hugely respected in this field. Relman is asking some very tough questions now essentially about the lack of debate, about the lack of a balanced debate. And I'm very pleased to see people like that standing up. And, uh, and I, I mean, they, these are very influential figures in terms of the relationship with Washington too. I mean, I suppose it's not, in, not inconceivable that, uh, um, that uh, yeah, a, a President Biden could stand up and say, well, our intelligence community has looked at this thoroughly and we've come to these conclusions. And they, they could conceivably be along the lines of the ones that you've... Uh, um, and I mean, that's, that's yeah, not impossible, I mean, Pompeo, is it? Pompeo, I don't know whether you've seen it, but Pompeo did yeah. publish State Department press things. Yes, which yes, did, yes. Um, uh, Come close to doing that, yeah. Yeah, yeah wow. it came pretty close to, to doing that. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And that um, was like four or five days ago. Yeah. You've, all, you've also been um, a strong uh, critic in the past of um, uh, the idea of Huawei being integrated into Britain's uh, 5G rollout. Are you, are you happy with the, uh, the U-turn that was done on that? The, the, the problem is that the UK in 2004, you know, signed, well, it was British Telecom, actually, BT, signed, signed a deal with Huawei. And um, ever since then, you know, Huawei have played an important role um, in our... Uh, infrastructure for, for IT and telecommunications. Um, I mean, getting Huawei out is actually quite complicated and difficult. And it, you can't just, as it were, take a decision and it happens. It's not going to happen like that. I think the important decision was to put down a marker that we shouldn't, as it were, build future infrastructure, which would be entirely dependent on the Chinese and Chinese technology. Uh, I, 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 I mean, when I, I was chief, when the original deal was signed with Huawei, and at the time, we were not consulted. Um, you know, the, the government let this go through. And uh, some of us, you know, when we heard about it, were, were intensely shocked. That, you know, we were becoming uh, partially dependent on Chinese technology then. 
And I think there's no question now with 5G, this is something we need to scale back uh, and we need to be wary of. And we need now, you know, to uh, encourage um, replacements, uh, have an industrial policy, which should make sure that our dependence on Huawei is reduced. Um, but I mean, I was militant about it because I, I felt that we were going in the wrong direction. And I'm really thrilled that we won this argument. And we have won it, really. That's astonishing that you weren't consulted about uh, an issue. Well, I mean, that was way back. I mean, it wasn't sensitive in those days. Well, I mean, it was sensitive, but... Um, and I, I mean, I, I'm slightly should say that, you know, I mean, I think GCHQ were giving, um, you know, were saying, well, you know, this isn't the problem, we can keep it under control. But I mean, some of us disagree with that. I mean, the problem is I've been trained as a poacher, not as a gamekeeper. And if you're a poacher, you know what, you know, you could achieve. The, um, uh, obviously the Chinese are furious uh, with this decision, as they will be over a number of other uh, UK policy decisions recently, not least uh, Dominic Raab uh, uh, referring to the Chinese regime as being responsible for barbarism uh, last week. Um, do, do you see any prospect of um, uh, 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 relations going into a, with, with China going into a really serious uh, freefall as they have with uh, Australia? And I suppose uh, uh, in addition to that, d d does it matter? I hope not. Yes, it does. I mean, I. I just think that, you know, we on our side have been incredibly naive in the way that we have treated the, 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 the commercial, and I mean that in the broader sense, relationship with China. Um, I mean, uh, um, I, I do accept that, we, you know, we are going to need a future relationship with China as Australia is. The question is how you manage it. Um, and I think the Chinese have to understand that we will manage it and we will manage it quite aggressively. Um, but um, they have to get used now to the fact that, you know, the sort of rather uncritical, easygoing approach we've taken in the past, you know, it, we're, we're not there to be set up and exploited. We're there to have, you know, a controlled trading relationship. And I think it's, and I think it's very challenging and very difficult to find out what that are, what that's going to be. And I, I mean, in the UK, you know, we, we have the specific problem of Hong Kong, um, although you know, the Chinese would claim it's nothing to do with us now, but that's not quite the reason, you know, we, we signed a deal with them over Hong Kong, the joint declaration. And of course, the whole question of their treatment of the Uyghur minority um, raises very, very serious issues. I'm an opponent, personally, of moral foreign policy. I think, you know, you need a pragmatic approach to these issues. And what I'm talking about is a much more pragmatic and modulated relationship with China, which I hope the Chinese would be able to accept. They're clearly finding it very difficult at the moment. Would you say that uh, the ideal foreign policy is a pragmatic and realistic one that takes into account moral questions as they impact other countries and, and yourself? I mean, you've got to be able to carry your electorate with you, for example. Yes, I think that we have. And, you know, you, we're not going to be able to exclude it um, completely. And, you know, maybe it's important not to buy, you know, a cotton crop that we know that has been picked by something that's not far away from slave labour. Uh, that I entirely accept. Yes. Well, Mark just discussed the question uh, um, uh, Biden's attitude to China, but could I just make the general point that in two days we're going to see um, President Biden come into office with a very different um, set of policies or attitudes, and secondly, uh, on a wave of goodwill from European policy circles, including those in Britain. So I wonder if you think that the relationship between the new administration and uh, Europe in the widest sense is going to be as um, successful and harmonious as a lot of opinion now seems to, to believe. Well, I'm not sure about that. And I mean, my reservations are basically if you go back to the Obama administration, you know, Obama's administration was not a glittering foreign policy success. 
And many of the same people that served Obama now have been brought back into Biden's administration. And I find that a bit worrying. And you, you can argue pretty convincingly that although one may have really, you know, disliked Trump's style in certain areas of foreign policy, there's been a measure of success um, or certainly a rethink. And, you know, if you take the relationship with China, clearly a rethink is important for all of us. Um, I think that Biden will find himself more captured by circumstance than we might understand. So I'm not sure there's going to be a great deal of room for movement on China. Um, although the tone of the relationship may, may be better. Um, I think, you know, the other sort of topical issue which is imminent, you know, is the JPCOA with the Iran and whether uh, the US get come, comes back into that agreement. I personally think it's a bad agreement. Um, and, you know, it's been a green light for Iran to misbehave internationally, which it's done in a pretty unrestrained fashion. And I, I think maybe Biden will find it pretty difficult to just sort of wave a wand and say, right, we'll re-sign the JCPOA, because it's clear that the Iranians are not behaving in the best fashion, particularly with relation to their nuclear program. Um, so I... I, I Goodwill, yes, um, for Biden, but he's going to be quite constrained, I think, in what he can actually do and what changes he can make, which in a way might be a good thing in terms of the sort of a realistic American foreign policy. Mark and I are sitting at the moment in Budapest. So I think we should really ask you a question about Central Europe. Uh, do you think there's any uh, substance to the claim uh, you get from the EU um, that the Central Europeans have somehow become less democratic, including in respect to, to um, relations to rule of law, particularly? Um, or is all this about the fact that the Visegrad countries reject the EU's orthodoxies on immigration, multiculturalism. In other words, how do you see the relationship between Central Europe and the rest of Europe developing? Um, in the, uh, and you, I think, knew, you, you know Central Europe well yourself from the past. Yeah, I served um, in uh, Czechoslovakia. When Czechoslovakia existed, I was there for four or five years. I've traveled quite extensively. And I have very strong interest in Central Europe. I, I think, I think what I, I would say is that you know, geopolitically, where you sit in Europe, issues look different. So if you're on the Polish border, or you're sitting in Hungary, you know your view of Europe is very different, as seen from Paris or Brussels. And I think that, that the, the, the sort of geopolitical elements are really fundamental. History is important. And I, I mean, a book that I thought was stunningly brilliant in um, explaining this was the short history of Germany, which I'm sure you have read. This sort of seminal division between, you know, the sort of Rhineland Western liberal traditions and then uh, the, the central East European uh, view. I mean, I think there's a, someone asked me the other day, uh, you know, about, and using the phrase Central Europe. Interestingly, when I was in Prague, which is west of Vienna, we actually all talked about Eastern Europe. <laughs> so how you conceptualize this part of Europe changes with the geopolitics of the region. I like and East, I think, East, 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 East Central Europe. East Central Europe, yeah. <laughs> and, and, and of course, it should be called Central Europe, but it isn't always a middle, you know, Central Europe. Um, and, you know, the world looks different if you're sitting in Budapest. And uh, I mean, I, I, and, and, and the history is very different. And um, I, uh, the idea, well, I, I, I mean, in terms of, I'm so skeptical of the rule of the ECJ. <laughs> uh, the judges that founded the ECJ, you know, we all know about this now from reading Perry Anderson. Um, you know, they were Vichy and 
where they had been active in, in occupied Europe. Um, I, no, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm, I'm actually basically very sympathetic to the nationalist identity of, as it were, the new member states of the European Union. And it takes me back, you know, to this um, conceptual view that, you know, the role of nation states in terms of building European security and, um, and you know, European social models in the future is going to be important. And you, you, you can't just deny that history. I mean, if you go to Poland, the Catholic Church is still a powerful social force. It may not be the church itself, but it is, as it were, the psychology and identity that underlines, uh, underlies that. And, you know, Hungary has its own very special and particular history. And it has its identity. And it's much, you know, closer um, to the prevailing influence of Russia or, let's say, the problems of immigration coming from illegal immigration. And inevitably, these countries are going to have their own views and roles. And it's up, as it were, to the EU to accommodate that, in my view. Hmm. What do you think? I mean, my impression is that what is coming out of Brussels towards Central Europe very often reflects a set of political opinions which might be described as really quite leftish. Um, and those views exist, of course, in Hungary and Poland. And in a way, you might say Poland's recent election showed the country was pretty well evenly divided. But they're not the universal. The views from Brussels do not find a universal echo in the countries of Central Europe. And, and yet they seem determined on certain questions, I would say, um, I would say immigration, for example, to impose those views. Absolutely. I, I mean, I couldn't agree with you more. And I mean, you know, I'm sitting here in Cambridge, you know, uh, if you want to live in a left wing city. Uh, and uh, I mean, you know, some, someone like me here, or let's say Robert Toombs, whose works I'm sure you're familiar with and have read. I mean, people like Robert and myself, I, I mean, uh, you know, we are rather anomalous because we hold views which are seen as, 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 as right wing. And I mean, what's interesting is, you know, this whole debate culturally across Europe. I mean, look, look, at, look at the way that the BBC have behaved. Um, the idea that you can have a sort of even spread of political opinion. Um, is anathema to certain groups, interest groups. And I, I find that intensely worrying because, I mean, I, I regard myself as very tolerant, if you see what I mean, of other people. <laughs> but they are but they're not tolerant of mine, necessarily. I mean, being a Brexiter in Cambridge was a very interesting experience. I mean, it was extraordinary. <laughs> No, I can well believe that. Um, let me say that I have one more question to ask, but Mark, perhaps you have one before I, I ask it. Uh, thank, thank, thanks, John. I just wanted uh, one, one, uh, one, one issue in particular to get your, your view on before we close, and that is um, uh, the special relationship between the US and the UK. Of course, there's been a lot of uh, concern about um, a revival of uh, Obama's favor, fa famous line about going to the back of the queue. Um, uh, the optimists, of course, point to the uh, to the, uh, the the leftish liberal ends of uh, end of, uh, of Boris Johnson's uh, sort of policy preferences. Uh, what's what what what's your sense? Is the special relationship going to be in good shape? And can uh, can you in Britain be reasonably confident of a of a trade deal with the U.S. in the in the not too far distant future? Um, well, usually. <laughs> It's needs must, if you see what I mean, in that, you know, once you get into power, these issues look different. So I think on the defence and security side, um, the relationship will continue to be very close. Um, but, I mean, I would say, you know, having been intimately involved in the special relationship, you know, really right inside it, right at the centre of it, which I was, the US for the UK are never a pushover. <laughs> um, you know, the, the, there is strong national interest on both sides. Uh, and there's very often disagreement, um, you know, particularly in certain areas. I mean, Ireland has, you know, the US and the UK have never really agreed 
totally on Ireland, and there have been tensions there. And, you know, Biden comes from an old Catholic family, and they have a very specific view of the Irish situation. In my view, though, this will not, as it were, prevent the UK and the US probably working together closely in a number of crucial areas. And as they work together closely, you know, that trust will increase and be built up. I mean, I know for a fact that, you know, for all the stresses and strains of the Trump administration and, you know, him accusing GCHQ of <laughs> intercepting um, American communications to favour, you know, the Democratic Party and the election and all of this rubbish. Um, the actual intelligence and defence relationship has pretty much carried on undamaged. And um, I, 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 I'm not saying there won't be some problems. I mean, trade, trade deals with the US are difficult. And, you know, there's a history of us disagreeing with the US on all sorts of trade issues, um, aviation, um, import of Scottish whiskey, um, all sorts of products which the Americans have caused the UK problems with. Uh, but I think probably there will be an incentive there on both sides to, to get a deal. Uh, and the, the, the idea that this, the, the, the Irish issue would intervene in that, I, I, I mean, Nancy Pelosi's statements and you know, there are one or two Irish extremists in Congress in the Democratic Party who've said some pretty stupid things. And they've been given a lot of publicity. But that doesn't, that doesn't reflect the general view. And I think there is still this sort of, and I'm not being a romantic here, there are shared values and a sort of coincidence of social view between the two countries which contribute to the survival of the special relationship over time. Mm. Yes, I think that's right. It's a shared culture which makes all kinds of agreements and cooperation possible, which isn't possible with every other ally, possibly. That's yeah, the way I... No, I, I, think that, I think that's good. And I spend a lot of time in the States. I mean, I'm in the States. Well, when I could travel, I'm in the States every six to eight weeks. <laughs> um, I, I, <laughs> so, I, mean, I haven't been there since last March. So it's a rather strange situation, but... Um... We're in exactly the same position. <laughs> um, um, my final question is that re recently one of your former colleagues died, namely Jean Le Carré. And I think those of us who are not a part of the intelligence world have probably taken a great deal um, uh, and understood a great deal about it from his novels. So I have to ask you, um, what's your view of Le Carre's novels on intelligence? Uh, and by the way, was he a good intelligence officer himself? Well, let me start with your last question first. No, he wasn't, apparently. Um, if you read carefully um, his um, obituary, there was a, a comment in the obituary, and I know exactly who made it, um, but I'm not going to tell you who, who said the trouble with, you know, Le Carre, John Corbell, when he was in the service, was... He, he never ran a successful case. <laughs> um, however, uh, clearly, you know, the six or seven years he spent between the security service first and then my service, uh, you know, seared his soul uh, and became the sort of inspiration for his writing. Now, I have to distinguish between, uh, you know, I'm happy to sort of, recognize his eminence as a writer of espionage um, and you know he wrote some damn good books the early ones are the best um, and, and the smiley books um, and, and, and in, in a sense they're quite authentic about the Cold War but I, I mean the reason why I have been critical of Le Carre and read the article I wrote uh, which was published with his obituary in the, in the Telegraph. Um, I mean, he really did besmirch my profession. Um, and he, what I, he, he, he flipped the concept of trust. And what I mean by that, all of his novels are based on suspicion, mistrust and betrayal. Now, of course, if you write an espionage novel about trust, it's not going to be very exciting. If you write it about betrayal, you know, it's going to be a bestseller if you write well, which he did. He wrote Britain. Um, But 
he wrote at a time when there was very little in the public domain about MI6. And in a way, you know, the veracity of his novels replaced the reality. Uh, and therefore, a lot of people's view of what my service was like and the people in it is based on Le Carre's concepts. And, you know, we're all cheating bastards who <laughs> are ready to stab, stab our colleagues in the back. And of course, that's a complete inversion of reality. Um, there are very, very high levels of trust in, if you're dealing with high level secrets and people's lives, which we were uh, and are to an extent um, for those still in the organization. So, uh, you know, I have been very critical of Le Carre. And I, 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 I mean, I, I said this at a literary festival uh, whilst he was still alive. And wow, did he come back at me strongly <laughs> within 24 hours? So we've had quite a sort of debate about this. Um, and of course, uh, anyway, it's quite a complex question, but I, I mean, I think that he was a complex character and it's difficult to understand him psychologically. His books are brilliant and, um, you know, they're, they're a damn good read. And when we were in the service as young officers, we were all reading them. But, you know, it did dawn on me, hang on, you know, there are some decent people around in this organisation who have strong moral compass. <laughs> Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, you know, on behalf of the Danube Institute, uh, you, I'm grateful for this interview. You've given us a lot of time and a lot of interesting, interesting things and a lot of wisdom. So. On behalf of the Institute, I want to thank you. And Mark, maybe you would like to uh, close. Yes, well, thank you very much indeed also from me. Uh, Sir Richard, it's, it's, uh, we've, we've really appreciated your time and insights. So, uh, so thank you very much indeed.